Hello everybody and welcome to the first ever Weekend Motorsport Roundup show on the Motorsport Life channels. We are now streaming live uh, to Twitch and YouTube. Um, so if you search for Motorsport Life on either of those platforms, you will uh, find us there. And we are, as I said, streaming live now. And these will also be set as videos after this broadcast. So if you are watching on Catch Up, hello. And uh, if you're watching live, then very big hello. Um, so as you can see, the way that it's going to be uh, running is that we will have topics for today. Um, which in this show on the Monday evening will be uh, all about motorsport that happened over the weekend. Um, there's the chat box. So if you message us in the chat, then... Uh, get involved, let us know what your thoughts on the weekend were, and what your highlights were, what the controversies were, um, and then you can also see the followers and donators there if you are kind enough to do either of those. So, uh, topics for today, as we can see, we'll just do a quick weekend roundup. There was, of course, the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. There's the WRC Rally Monte Carlo. There was the Formula E Prix, Santi the Santiago E Prix. That's the one. And there was uh, quite a lot of other motorsport, ranging from obviously the AMA Supercross, the fourth round there. And there was even things like club karting at Wilton Mill, which we will get into. And then uh, number five, if we've got time at the end, we will then look ahead to next weekend. Um, so as I said, this was the um, uh, this is the first stream of the weekend roundup show, and we are also doing a uh, live show on Wednesday evenings as well, which is just called the Motorsport Live Show. On that, we do less of looking back at the weekend. We do more of what's going on in motorsport, the big stories, any technologies or interesting politics or anything like that. Then uh, we have a look at it. And obviously, again, if you guys have a uh, preference on what you want to see, then do please let us know. So, without further ado, I bring to you the Weekend Roundup. So, what did we have on? Well, as we said, we had the Daytona 24 Hours, which was probably the biggest event of the weekend, I would say. Although, interestingly, WTF1 did a uh, Twitter poll to see what people were watching. And it was actually Formula E at Santiago that came out on top, then Daytona, then uh, WRC in Monte Carlo, and then other. So, interestingly, um, Formula E got was had more people viewing it or people on twitter who were viewing it um now i would say that wtf1 up obviously more of a european slash uk based company so it's always going to be higher for that sort of thing because it is available on terrestrial tv and also available on youtube fairly easily to watch formula e uh, which they do have going for them. It's very good. Uh, whereas they turned to 24 hours, you obviously had to go and find the live feed on the IMSA website, which, you know, is less simple than just going on YouTube or going onto ITV. They do also have that awful uh, YouTube coverage with uh, random gamer YouTubes like KSI and Ali A. Uh, not for me. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so, anyway, what... Um, what happened in Daytona 24? Well, as Jimmy Broadbent, the very famous sim racer, said, it was very much a uh, selection of five-minute sprints because of the weather. Um, there was a lot of stoppages. There was like a 90-minute safety car period followed by a red flag. And ultimately, it got red flagged, I think. I think it got red flagged about two hours from the end, but they officially called it, you know, off not to restart about at 23 hours and 50 minutes but um that didn't stop the action from happening i mean in my opinion it signals the start of the proper road racing season and i know uh formula e is kind of taking on that mantle now and um things like ama supercross which we'll come on to and also the parry dakar and things like that happened before it but in terms of circuit racing i really would say that daytona 24 is or oh, sorry the rolex 24 is is very much the one to look out for in the future for kind of the kicking off of your motorsport season. It is a very good event. I'd say it is certainly getting up there with uh, Le Mans and certainly in the Nürburgring 24 hours as kind of the most prestigious 24 hours. I mean, you only have to look at the names taking part like Kamui Kobayashi, Fernando Alonso, uh, Sebastian Bourdais, you know, Harry Tinknell, Andy Prio, all of these people 
Juan Pablo Montoya, obviously. Um, so there's a lot of people getting involved, and it um, and it, it it's kind of the highest motorsport level certainly that's available at the moment we haven't even had f1 cars launched yet we've started to get some moto gp bikes launched um which on my instagram page which is at motorsport life official you'll see some uh, interesting uh, stuff on there we've just seen the launch of the new patronus srt uh, moto gp team with the, Ham- the new yamaha satellite team uh, replacing the tech 3 team so you'll get stuff like that if you follow us on instagram um, but overall, the Daytona 24 hours uh, is is quite hard to follow in the UK. I will give it that, especially if you're working on Sunday like I was. I know, working on Sunday. Um, and um, it was great. I mean, the cars at the front now are super quick. The pole lap uh, by Oliver Jarvis was a new lap record. So it just kind of shows that the speeds that they're getting to, you know, it's over 200 miles an hour. There's a good uh, split between the classes and... Um, you know, it's not too overcrowded because obviously the circuit's a lot shorter than Le Mans. So it um, is going to be uh, it's going to be a good race. Obviously, it's a hard race, especially when it's raining. Um, a lot of the cars are or some cars perform a lot better in the rain than others, which is why some of them fell by the wayside. But in the end, it was Felipe Nasa versus Alonso. He managed to get the job done when even though he was asking for the race to be stopped while he was still in second before he even got into the lead. That's how bad the conditions were. And um, just to kind of put that into context, if you try and find a video from uh, Tony Vylander, who's in one of the Ferrari GTE cars. Is it GTE in America or is it GTD? Anyway, he's in the Ferrari 488. And um, he uh, shared an onboard video of what it was like to drive in the kind of the rain and the fog that was in there and he's driving on the back straight you know not even flat out probably three quarter speed and then suddenly bang there's a Porsche in the way um and he just hits it unfortunately um so if I can get this working yeah there we go um it will show here yeah Alonso wanted Daytona to be halted while he was still in second so he was saying things like, I called a lot of times when I was second over the radio that the safety car was necessary. The last five, seven laps of the race were not right for anyone on track. The sixth lap, though, was fine. <laughs> the visibility was nearly zero. We we could not be flat out on the straights. The car, this is interesting, though. He says, we could not be flat out on the straights. The car was moving. The tractor car was coming in in sixth gear at 200 miles an hour. You were doing 200 miles an hour, but weren't flat out and there were parts of different cars in different parts of the track because people were losing body work now this is definitely a um kind of issue that i wanted to raise or not an issue but a point of discussion that i wanted to have and it was very much the point of should races be stopped due to weather now i know that sounds a bit kind of meat heady and it's a bit like oh let them just drive around it doesn't matter if they crash that's not what i'm saying what I'm saying is that, yes, it's dangerous if you go at speed on standing water. We all know that. You can aquaplane, which can mean you spin. And obviously in Daytona, where they have the walls, in very close proximity, they can hit the wall pretty hard. But you can go as slow as you want. People are like, oh, well, you might you know, hit a car that's spun in front of you. It's like, well, go slower. Maybe that's a bit of a pure aisle and simplified way of looking at it, but... I'm kind of like, well, just go slower. You know, you can do 10 miles an hour if you want to. You can do 20 miles an hour. Go in idle in second gear and just crawl around. But I guess, I don't know. It's, I think Oliver Jarvis was even tweeting at the time saying, as a fan's point of view, I'd love for them to just, you know, suck up and get racing. But as a driver, there's no way we should be racing. So I guess you do have to look at the safety overall. But it's just a bit disappointing, you know, that a race doesn't get to finish under its own kind of steam, if that makes sense. You know, it's still, um, you know, it gets red flagged and doesn't start again. So it was slightly disappointing, but, you know, not too bad at the end of the day. It was a great race, a lot of great coverage as well, um, as always. And if you follow us on Twitter, which is at Motorsport Life underscore, Uh, go and see who we follow there's loads of teams and drivers and race series who we follow there who are um 
uh, you know who are worth uh, following we don't kind of do follows for follows or anything like we only really follow people who are uh, you know worth following put out good content you know whether it's information or news or whether it's broadcasting uh, anything like that so go and check out who we're following on twitter and uh, you should start find some uh, really decent kind of content on there so i guess that then leads us on to uh the next topic for today which is the wrc uh rally monte carlo now i've kind of gone a bit shorter on Daytona 24 because this is where I'm getting really excited. I am so, so excited for the WRC season this year, the World Rally Championship, um, especially after seeing the Monte Carlo Rally. Um, again, I'll see if I can get some stuff up on here for you guys. Um, where are we? Let's have a look. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Where is it? Okay, yeah, so here we go. So check this out. Um, so obviously, Sebastian Auger beats Thierry Neuville in a final stage showdown. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, then I don't know what will. <laughs> it, um, it, it went down to the final stage. Going into the last stage, they were 0.4 of a second apart and by the end of it they were 2.2 seconds after three hours of racing three hours in two completely different cars and they ended up 2.2 seconds apart and i i think that is fantastic and a lot of others would have been closer if they didn't have problems um but sebastian Ogier, what can you say the og i mean he's not the goat let's be honest because how could he be because sebastian Loeb's there but anyway um i do really um i do really like it and what was i going to say yeah sebastian oj so his first season with citroen having left ford at the end of last year there was a lot of question marks over that decision because um well we know it was because uh ford weren't putting in as much backing as he'd hoped into the m sport team uh citroen uh, obviously had the backing but they had a really bad 2018 season they dropped Chris Meek halfway through the season they didn't really have a leader then they had Craig Breen and Andreas Mickelson maybe so you know no real big name to lead them and I think they came fourth in the th- certainly third or fourth in the Constructors Championship so they were looking for something to turn it around and getting Sebastian Ogier back after he left under difficult circumstances but that was caused by his partnership um with uh sebastian Loeb, and um but what can i say you know this season for wrc is going to be amazing they've got the obviously the four um manufacturers in it now toyota hyundai citroen and ford and by the looks of it you know they're all on they're all in good form i'd say ford's probably the weakest with their lineup having lost sebastian ogier but Elfin Evans is doing well. You know, he had a few issues in this. But, you know, Hyundai are coming off a strong 2018 where Nerville could have won. Um, you've got uh, Toyota, who've got a really strong lineup now with Oit Tanak and Chris Meek and Yari Mati Latvala, argu- arguably the strongest lineup. You know, they've got their car dialed in now. And who else have we got? And then we've got Citroen, obviously, with Sebastian Ogier. And I think it's Danny Sordo again, mixed with Craig Breen. And I can't remember where Andreas Mickelson's gone. Does it say on here? Let's have a look. Uh, Chris Meek. Timu Sunanen, he's with, the, he's with um, them. Uh, no, it doesn't tell me. But anyway, oh, Hyundai driver Mickelson. Okay, so he's with Hyundai as well. So they've got a strong team as well. But I do think that um, uh, Toyota are looking the strongest, I would say. Oit Tanak was very, very quick after he had an issue uh, early in the rally. So I think he's going to be the one to watch overall. You know, he finished 2018 the strongest, although, again, he didn't quite make it at the end. But I think over this season, he's going to be strongest. I'd love to see either Oit Tanak or Thierry Norville win because it's their first championship. You know, it's a new manufacturer. Uh, Sebastian Ogier winning again. No one likes seeing somebody win loads and loads, do they? 
So I think it it's important for the sport that somebody else wins because I th- he's won the last six Monte Carlo rallies, including this one. And, you know, he's he's going to be one of the best for a long time, I would think. He's probably going to go on for a few seasons if he keeps his pace up this year. Um, so to get somebody else would be excellent. And if you watch any of the clips of um, these WRC cars in action, I'll see if I can get one up for you now. Uh, let's have a look. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Let's see if we can get this to work. Hang on. Whoops. <laughs> Let's have a look at this <laughs> They sound awesome. They look impressive. Um, so, you know, look, they're flat out and they sound awesome, they look awesome. You look, I mean, those people would probably look close. Here's the Toyotas. So again, it's under the Toyota Gazoo Racing, which also run the Dakar car that won for uh, Nasser al They also ran uh, the, also run the uh, LMP1 cars for Fernando Alonso and teammates. Um, so, you know, they've got a lot of experience, but Tom Nakano running that as well, I think, is a master stroke. No. Yeah, WRC went through a really tough time a few years ago, kind of three, four, five years ago. They were really struggling. And I think the, I think the main thing to realise now is that we're, we're in its prime. And it's just unfortunate that it's not so easy to watch in the UK again. They do highlights every day on YouTube. And I think it's on ITV4. It just pain me a bit that these people probably film every single car that goes past and don't actually stop and enjoy it. But. <laughs> See, these are WRC 2 cars, maybe even group N, and even these, uh, R5 I think that is, because that's one of the Polos, yeah, and that's the Skoda Fabia, yeah. So even those cars look awesome, you know, and I just can't wait to see how this season pans out, to be honest. Um, and obviously you've got drivers who are more specialist on certain surfaces you know the Scandinavian drivers usually are better on the snow events like Finland uh, no Finland isn't sorry Sweden um, you know Oit Tanak and Yari Mati Latvala are normally better suited to that you've got still got tarmac specialists which used to be a massive thing like you'd have Gilles Pinizzi and people like that who were you know who would only be drafted in for the tarmac rallies um, which always confused me. It's like, why why would they just do tarmac rallies? Why wouldn't they do circuit racing and things like that? So I guess, you know, rallying is very different to circuit racing in terms of you need pace notes, etc. But it, it seems a bit odd to me. But anyway, um, so WRC is in a great place. Uh, I can't actually remember where we're going next. Let's have a look, shall we? Uh, championship so we're off to rally Sweden next um, so that is the 14th to the 17th of February so it's the usual long gap between uh, the first and the second event here um, oh yeah there's Esapakilapi that's why I forgot uh, you can watch it all live on the WRC plus but obviously you have to pay for that privilege uh, which isn't you know an issue it's not extortionally expensive um sorry i'm just reading this so yeah we've got rally sweden in on the 14th of february valentine's day easy for us to 
remember and then we go to the 7th of March in Mexico so I'd say Sweden you're looking at people like Oit Tanak, Yari Mati Latvala to probably come through but there was um, there was a lot of uh, crashes you know Monte Carlo is renowned for having fairly tricky um, what's the word fairly tricky conditions you know it can go from ice to tarmac to snow um, and it's all about tyre option and uh, a couple of them got them wrong, like Sunanen ploughed off into a field, into a ditch, sorry. Elfin Evans, the same fate, unfortunately. Um, Andreas Mickelson ripped a wheel off. So, you know, these are still some of the best rally drivers in the world, and they, they make mistakes on that rally, especially because of the uh, because of the conditions. And I remember, was it last year or the year before, where they were, you know, going so slowly because they weren't expecting it to be uh, so icy. And... You know, I love it. I think it's going to be great. We're back into a golden era. And do go and check them out. Subscribe to their YouTube channel because um, they do great highlight videos. I've just uh, retweeted one on uh, on our Twitter, which, as I said, is at motorsportlife underscore. Um, so go and check that out and you can watch it there. So I want to see what happens if I do this. So that's it for Monte Carlo. And let's move on to uh, the next uh, topic. So the next topic is the E Prix in Santiago. So Formula E, very very divisive motorsport as we know. Um, so so this should appear in the chat if I show you this. Um, just so you know how this works. So if I post that in there, it then appears on the screen. So, you know, you can get talking and you can get live on the, um, you can go live on the uh, screen and you will, of course, get involved and I will pick that up. So, as I said, Formula E is very much... Oh, come on. Sorry, technical issues. So, yeah, we're talking about the Santiago e Prix, And as I said, Formula E, since its inception, has been a pretty divisive motorsport, I would say. Now, there's a lot of Neanderthals who are just like, no, I don't want to talk about... Uh, I don't, I'm not interested in an electric motorsport. Which I think is a bad way to approach it, obviously. I'm very open-minded. I love motorsport. So... I don't really care. If it's got an engine of any form and it's competitive, I will watch it and I'll be interested in it. So I think the issue is the sound is one of them and also the circuits. But this season, I would say it's definitely taken a step forward in terms of the performance, in terms of the show, in terms of the racing. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend the Marrakesh e uh, obviously in Morocco, and uh, it was my first time experiencing it live. And I kind of had with withheld judgment. I mean, how can I judge something if I haven't seen it in person? Uh, and this is my kind of rundown of that. I enjoyed the, the way it was run. You know, it's over one day. It's in a city. There's people arriving all the time. It's busy. There's a lot to do. There's a great fan zone with a lot going on. There's a big gaming arena, which obviously in this day and age is very important and, you know, very interactive, which is absolutely perfect. The cars look great this year. You know, they look very futuristic. And um, the main thing is that they don't have to change cars in the middle of the race, which was a little bit Mickey Mouse. But hey, they got on with it. That's that's the point. They did it anyway. They didn't wait wait another six years to start it until they could do it. They just got on with it, which I really like. Um, so they're the things that I liked about it. Um, I liked I like the drivers in it. Obviously, it's got a very good crop of drivers. You know, there's ex Formula One drivers now with Stoffel Van Dorn, Felipe Massa. Nick Heidfeld. Uh, is Nick Heidfeld still in it? 
No, he's not. He's management now, isn't he? Um, obviously, those names. Then you've got, you know, very uh, John Eric Verne, um, Lucas Degrassi, Sebastian Buemi. Then you've got very highly regarded drivers like Oliver Rowland, um, Robert Freins, Daniel Apt, Mortara, who's obviously from DTM. So, you know, it's got great, great drivers. And it... <sighs> They're, they're the good things. That's the good things. Now, the biggest disappointment for me wasn't even necessarily the sound. It's the speed. It's the lack of speed in the cars. Now, by that, I don't mean necessarily acceleration because, as we know, electric cars are very fast accelerating. Um, and they do make a noise. I mean, it's a very odd noise and it's a swooshy kind of whiny noise. But it, they're not quick. I was lucky enough to be up in one of the uh, uh, boxes in the start finish straight and when the cars were you know three four laps in you know when it settled down a little bit they went past and it wasn't quick you know it was probably 100 miles an hour I would say now I think speed is one of the key factors in motorsport certain motorsports there are slow motorsports but that's a different video um speed in this environment you need it because it adds the danger level it you know it, it's the spectacle anybody can drive a car at 100 miles an hour in a straight line pushing it you know that in like Le Mans or F1 up to 200 miles an hour you're like wow that's fast whereas some people are like I've done 100 miles an hour on the motorway not me obviously um, and it it's slow and that was the case now the race in marrakesh was very entertaining obviously you know there was a lot of controversy with the bmw drivers taking each other off for some inexplicable reason in uh from first and second but anyway the santiago epre happened and again there was a lot of controversy there was only 13 finishes from 22 uh, it was a very attritional race uh, Sam Bird won, which is great for the Brits. He's now leading the championship ahead of Jerome D'Ambrosio because he picked up a penalty uh, for speeding under a yellow flag, I think. Um, unfortunately, the Nissan... Hang on, let me get my... The Nissan... That says Nissan, there's my... I don't know if you can see. Um, the Nissan lead driver, Spassian Boemi, he had a software issue and ended up crashing out of the lead which was very annoying. He qualified on pole. Um, so that was unfortunate. Uh, so Sam Bird won. Uh, Pascal Verline. Now, Pascal Verline, he he shouldn't be in Formula E, is my, in my humble opinion. He's there because it was the only thing available. He should be in F1. He is very talented. And I think he didn't obviously get an opportunity to show that in Marrakesh. He had a problem earlier on. I can't remember what the problem was. But in this race, he really did show how good, how talented of a driver he is. You know, he came to second in only his third ever race. He didn't get any testing. And he was, you know, flat out, absolutely flat out. And he nearly caught Sam Bird at the end. So I think he's a bit of a wasted talent. If he could dovetail it with something else, then great. Um, but yeah, it's really disappointing that he's not in F1 this year. Um, I think he's one of those drivers that really, really does, um, you know, he really does deserve it because he's showing his talent. He seems like a great guy, you know, in his interviews, he comes across very well. He's passionate. You know, he slammed the door in the garage when he retired last week, didn't he? Um, and, you know, he's doing great. And it, it, if he can, you know, keep that going, he's he's got to be a, a contender for the championship. And I think... BMW are probably happy in one sense. I'm really disappointed in another. In the same for Nissan, actually. Uh, you know, they're big manufacturers who are putting their eggs in this basket. And uh, they've both got a good pace, which is what they're going to be uh, happy about. You know, Boemi was on pole. Um, well, Lucas de Grassi actually qualified on pole by over half a second. But he... Now, this was a weird rule, and he has now complained about it, which I agree with. Let's just have a look at this. Uh, where is it? Uh, it's on here somewhere. Yeah, Degrassi slams very stupid 
FE brake rule after qualifying exclusion. The Audi driver originally claimed pole, as I said, by half a second, but was excluded and sent to the back of the grid by violating Article 27.9 of FE sporting regulations. This relates to an amendment filed by FE chassis supplier Spark ahead of the race in Santiago regarding brake usage on in-laps during qualifying. Audi and Degrassi explained that the update requires all drivers to brake in exactly the same way on their in-laps as they do in their flying laps. Why? It has been introduced on safety grounds to avoid damaging damage to the brakes. Uh, has asked the FIA for clarification on the rule which has not been made public but had not received a reply by the time of publication. After its exclusion for qualifying, Degrassi originally called the amendment the most stupid rule motorsport has ever created. <laughs> I mean... Tell us how you really feel, Lucas. <coughs> Blimey. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I sort of have to agree. He started the race 22nd and eventually qualified 12th after he received a 34-second post-race penalty. <laughs> Dole! For contact with Dragon driver Jose Maria Lopez that dropped him down the order. As well to spot about the introduction of the rule. There are a lot of stupid rules in motorsport, but this one is very stupid one. I don't know if it's the most stupid one, but I think this rule should be revised immediately for the next race. Basically, I got disqualified for not using my brake pedal in the right way on my in-lap during qualifying. I think, yes, they might need to enforce that rule. Fine. Not a problem. But... Don't penalise him by putting the pole sitter at the back of the grid. It just seems unfair. You know, maybe fine the driver or something. You know, it's still going to stop them from doing it, isn't it? And it's not going to affect the show because Lucas Degrassi is a previous winner of the championship. So he obviously knows what he's doing. Um, so, yeah, I do think that's a bit petty, to be honest. Sorry, water break. well yeah so I don't think he should have been penalised in that way it's just not not the way to do it for the fans in my humble opinion now um, so yeah the good thing is that Sam Bird is leading Jerome D'Ambrosio is close behind which is good, great to see um, and it's good to see that the races are entertaining and fans do seem to be engaging with it a lot more. Um, a, a friend of mine has said that he thinks that obviously Formula E will have made it when somebody chooses it over Formula 1, which I think will only happen, or the, the reason it will happen soon or sooner than you might expect is because of salaries. You know, if manufacturers are all going to um, Formula E, and some of them are leaving Formula One or, you know, not putting as much money into Formula One, then where's the money going to be for drivers? It's going to be Formula E. So if a driver, you know, gets paid X million to go and race in Formula E or gets paid, you know, 500 grand or, you know, a free drive in Formula One, which are they going to choose? Now, obviously, your heart's going to say Formula One, but their head, you know, looking to the future and you know, setting themselves up for families and all of that. Are they going to take the money? Who knows? We can only wait and see. But it it's interesting. It is interesting to see what people might think and how it goes, to be honest. So let me know if you're watching this in broadcast. Let me know down in the comments uh, or send us a tweet, as I said, at motorsport, undersc at motorsport life underscore. Um, but hey, let's move on to the next uh, topic. So, let's talk about AMA Supercross, because I personally think it's awesome. Um, so, AMA Supercross, I see as the start of the motorsport season currently. Um, it starts early in January, and it runs all the way through to the end of March, and it is pretty much every weekend. I think there's only one weekend that it doesn't happen and it's a two-week gap. Um, so the way I see it is it's very different to circuit racing. So I know a lot of people watching this will um, kind of not not be interested and be kind of like, oh, well, they're just you know riding around in the mud. But I have to say, I think it's probably one of the most physically challenging 
motorsport. It's certainly one of the most dangerous. You know, top riders get injured in it every single year. Um, and I think it's one of the most spectacular in terms of the way that you can watch it live. Um, you know, they do it in sports stadiums, so it's kind of like the Race of Champions. And I think Race of Champions highlights how circuit racing doesn't work in a stadium. It's too short. You know, there's not the speed, whereas you add in jumps and technical and mud and the close nature of Supercross, it shows that it really does work on in that environment, you know, around Supercross. Um, now, so Cooper Webb won. So he is now the first first double winner. Uh, and he's done it back to back of 2019. Um, but it, it's gonna be topsy turvy this year. I'll just try and get the standings up on my screen. Um, but yeah, you know, it hasn't been a runaway leader. A lot of people were thinking that maybe Jason Anderson would kick on from last year. Um, or somebody like Ken Roxon or Eli Tomac would run away with it. Um, but it, it just hasn't happened so far. Uh, so here we go. I'll just bring this up one second. Uh, yeah, so we've got Cooper Webb, who... Is, is that by... Oh, yeah, finishing position. So he's got a fifth, a tenth, and then a first and a first. So he's obviously turned his season around pretty well. Ken Roxon, as you can see, and Eli Tomac and Marvin Muskan are kind of at the consistent point. Marvin Muskan's probably uh, pretty happy with that. He obviously is going to want to get a win soon. And as is, well, as are all three of those, to be fair. Um, Cooper Webb's kind of done the opposite of Justin Barsha. You know, Justin Barsha started with that win, which probably no one was expecting. He's a very good rider, but he's never, you know, been right up at the sharp end before. Um, uh, sorry, he's only ever won one before. Um, but, you know, he's not normally a top three rider. He so And he's kind of tailed off a little bit. So, and where's Jason Anderson? Yeah, he has not had a good season. And I think, is he injured now? Uh, I'm not too sure. Now, I would like to shout out Dean Wilson, actually. Um, one of the main reasons for that is he's got a great YouTube channel, which we are subscribed to. Uh, so you go. He's got 78,000 subscribers. That's 78,000 more than me. <laughs> um, but yeah, he is riding privately this year. So he's not with the team. Yes, he'll have backing from sponsors and maybe even a bike uh, supplier, manufacturer. Um, but he, uh, yeah, is a privateer. So to get those results and, you know, be up in sixth, a fourth, an eighth, a fifth, and a sixth, he's doing really well. Uh, and he does have some really cool videos on here. He's dressed... He's disguised himself as a grandpa to do motocross. Uh, he did a really cool vlog uh, sort of video for Anaheim 1, although, as you can see, that was two weeks ago. He's obviously been pretty busy in between that, but, you know, shows training videos, his t tough year in 2018. There's some really good um, stuff on there, so go and check that out. Uh, Blake Baggett, again, he's managed to win one, but, again, he's had two really poor results with 12th and 15th. And Cole Seeley just hasn't really hit his stride, as everyone would expect. Chad Reed, getting a bit older, but still enjoying himself. Um, and I guess that's kind of it for people who you would expect to be right up at the sharp end. Just checking, like Malcolm Stewart, uh, Justin Bogle, Joey Savacci. I mean, I always love, as an English person, I love the Supercross riders' names. That sounds really odd, but I find them really cool because um, they're, they're always cooler than the English name. I mean, my name's Paul. How boring is that? We've got people like Joey Sabachi. Um, stuff like that. It's cool. Um, so, yeah, I'll just try and bring up the uh, schedule for AMA Supercross and show you kind of what we're dealing with here. Um, schedule and tickets. Here we go. Um, where are we? So we go on website viewer. There we go. Um, so yeah, we've had Anaheim one, Glendale, Anaheim two, Oakland. We've got San Diego, San Diego Islands. <laughs> um, on this weekend or this yeah this coming weekend. Um, so check that out again. It is very hard to watch in the UK. This is the problem. I would watch it almost religiously. Um, but unfortunately, there's not much coverage. The AMA Supercross uh, YouTube channel 
is okay. It's okay. Um, Monster Energy Supercross is the name of the channel. Whoops. Um, so they do have a lot of videos and they've got a decent subscriber base, but obviously they don't show live footage they've got highlights but look they're really short you know they're only two minutes um so it's very much a highlight reel as opposed to a very short highlight reel but they do have a lot of interviews with riders a lot of post-race stuff you know um virtual track laps beforehand um and you know a lot of behind the scenes stuff with riders so it is good you know we are subscribed it's a great championship so jason anderson yeah you see look they've obviously had him pegged as the um, the guy who's going to go on and win two, uh, but it's not looking likely at the moment. Um, and obviously, Coop, Cooper Webb, Coop isn't on there. Um, but hey, yeah, so go and check it out. Uh, yeah, San Diego, Petco Park, uh, the West Coast. So as you can see, this is split into West Coast and East Coast championships, but that's for the 250 class. So the 250, you either race at the West, on the West Coast or you race on the East Coast, which I guess is because of uh, distance that you need to travel and keeping costs down. Um, and there's a couple which are dual, and obviously Vegas is the big finale in May. So let's move on to the next subject. Next topic is... Oh, we're still... We're still on other motorsport, aren't we? So, uh, the karting season kicked off. Um, now, you might be surprised to hear that so early in the year, but it has. And by that, I mean there are now club championships. Now, if you're not 100% sure uh, of what that means, I will now try and demonstrate. Wilton Mill Kart Club. So, I'm just going to pause it so you don't hear all the noise. It's great. So if we go on to this, you should be able to see. Yeah. Uh, so you should be able to see. So Alpha Live, great YouTube channel. They show loads of live motorsport, whether that's on two wheels or four. And it's all grassroots stuff. So it is things like uh, national karting. It's club karting, club 100, mini motor racing, etc. And uh, I'll just turn the sound off for now. But you'll see, so look at this. This was a six and a half hour broadcast with proper graphics, full commentary, uh, proper camera work, onboard cameras, the works. So this is Honda Cadets. So this is uh, juniors. I think they're about eight years old. Are they rolling up? Is that a rolling up lap or have they started? Let's just try and work this out. Oh, yeah, they're not rolling up there, are they? So, um, yeah, I'll just leave this playing on the screen for a minute while we talk through it. But um, so each uh, racetrack or, you know, certified racetrack in the UK, kart track, has a karting club, which you pay to be a member of. Um, it's bring your own carts. And obviously they have various different rules and regulations that you have to stick to. Um, so these are the Honda Cadets for junior drivers but you know if you have a son then and they want to go karting you can buy them a cart and you then take it to the circuit on the race meeting to pay your entry fee pay for your tires your fuel etc and you send them racing and you ha you can be like the club champion to you race against the same people at the same track throughout the year um and these people the people who win this normally go on to kind of national level if you do well, well there you'd go to international so here you go, as you can see, we'll give a bit of commentary. Number 21, uh, which was James Bell. So into the first couple of corners they go. Always great racing in the Honda Cadet. Much more even start this time than the first heat when Mitchell Gibbons galloped away into Christmas corner. They come for the first time then. And James Bell but I think the main thing is you can see already that a lot of money of is spent the now on into these. Ashby corner then. So let's have a look for at maybe one of the faster so x30 mini so these are i think junior is probably about 12 right. years old 10 right. to 12 this maybe 
an interesting one. Most of them on slick. Still looks fairly dry though, but there is rain Lost in the go. air. Ooh, we are racing. Wild at the back. Oh, there's a bit of contact already. Ooh, a couple of drivers and off. Dear. Oh, there's two of them off, three of them off, maybe four. Dee. Albie Rigby is one of what them. What are you doing? And I think Look, that's drivers the very famous one. <laughs> straight away by slippery conditions offline as there's been a little bit of rain. Ooh. A lot of the drivers really struggling for grip. This is, oh, and there was a spin there for one of the JDR drivers, oh. and this is all going to be about which drivers can cope with slicks in wet conditions, because none of them, unless some of them had some uh, so, eyes on as you radars, can see, you know, this is great coverage, you can subscribe, the, uh, you know, you'll get a notification when they go live, or you can then, um, on wet tires at or all. then They're you can obviously ca do catch up broadcast, you know, it's had nearly 4,000 views, which for 4,000 well, subscriptions is pretty damn good, they're getting great cut they through there. Um, so, I, uh, I love karting, I think it's great, and um it started already this year which is great there's um also winter championships which just don't get the coverage that they deserve um you know Jeanette have a winter championship the radical winter championship etc um but unfortunately they just don't get the coverage there is the andros trophy i guess i'm actually going to find out about that now i don't know if you've ever heard of the andros trophy but it is snow racing uh It'll all be in French because it is a French. Uh, do we need to translate or can you put it into English? Uh, results. Calendar, here we go. So the calendar for this, I imagine it's already started. Oh, uh, yeah, so it started in December. So it's 8th of December and then the last one is on the 9th. If you have a look at this, the last one is on the 9th of December. So yeah, it's these cars. They're kind of very really strange. They are like a shell based on a car, but they're all stickers. Like there's no actual lights on them. They do sometimes race at night where obviously they do put them on. Uh, some of the cars have windscreen wipers on the windows, the side windows, because they go so sideways um so yeah i mean that is a thing it doesn't really get any coverage especially now motors tv it isn't on tv um, anymore unfortunately um but hey you know it's disappointing really because any motorsport is good motorsport um so i that's going to be the roundup for the for this weekend um so that only leaves us one thing and that is to uh Bear with me. See if you notice a change here. Oh, um, so that just leaves us to talk about next weekend. Now, uh, the big one for me next weekend. Uh, so this weekend, kind of, what date is that? Uh, second and third is the Liquid Moly Twelve Hours of Bathurst because. It is one of the coolest races in the year. And the reason for that is it's at Bathurst. Uh, yeah, I mean, the one in the, the end, the last 15 minutes, here you go, or last 16 minutes, I'm not going to play it all, obviously, of the 2015 Bathurst was insane. So we had, where is he? So we had Katsumasa Chiyosan in the Nissan GTR GT3 chasing down Lauren Van Tor in the uh, Audi and was it Guy Smith, I think, in the um, in the Bentley and he hunted them down and won and it was sick. But... Oh, let's go back behind the safety car. So yeah, I think here we go. This is where an overtake happens, I think. Oh, he's already got past them. Anyway um and yeah so it's going to be bigger and better as they always say now the big thing to let you know is uh if i go to my subscriptions nismo.tv have already put up their reminders says they are broadcasting the main race live completely on uh 6 80 p.m uk time on the second so it's 12 hours the race obviously when does it finish? Wee. Um, so, yeah, it goes um, 
goes on for 12 hours around Bathurst. You know, the creme de la creme of um, uh, GT racing will be there. Um, you know, all the big marks like Nissan, Audi, McLaren, Ferrari, they're all there vying for uh, the win. And they have to be... It has to be one of the best ones that I've seen. The, the track is so unforgiving with the... Um, you know, with the walls so close, the speed, the undulations, it, you can tell that it's actually physically demanding for the drivers and it's very difficult. You get some nasty accidents. Um, and the fact that GT cars go around there is great. Um, and yeah, you should definitely go and check out Nismo TV because they uh, will be broadcasting it live, you know, with full commentary throughout the whole 12 hours. Um, if you can't get in front of a... Um, screen then have a listen to it on Radio Le Mans they broadcast all all um, endurance races so do go and check them out as well um, but that is going to round it up as I said thank you for uh, getting in touch for those of you that did if you're watching this on um, uh, catch up on YouTube or Twitch then hello but let me know what you'd like to see uh, in the Motorsport Live show which is at 5pm UK time on Wednesday uh, we'll just be talking generally about what is going on in the uh, motorsport world. And um, that is going to be it. I do hope that you uh, enjoyed yourselves. Uh, thank you so much for watching and hopefully I will see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>